Hi, and welcome to the British Museum. My name's Jessica, and I'm one of the guides for free tours by Foot London. I specialize in the East End and in museums. And today, I'm really excited to be taking you on a highlights tour of the world famous British Museum. Now this museum is based on the original collection of a man called Sir Hans Sloane, who we're gonna meet a little bit later on. It's one of the world's biggest museums with over 8 million different artifacts, and it's one of the most famous. And let's face it, it's also one of the world's most controversial. By the way, if you'd like a video just on the controversies of the British Museum, let me know in the comment section below. But today we're going to explore some of its highlights. Items like the Rosetta Stone, the Egyptian mummies, the Lewis Chessman, the Sutton Hoo, Hoa Hakananaya, and so much more. The British Museum is free, it's open to the public, and it's a brilliant place to visit the next time you're in London. I guide public tours of it and also private tours. Let me know if you have any specific questions in the comments below, and I'll try to answer them on future videos. All right, it's certainly time to get out of this rain. I'm walking towards the front entrance of the British Museum. If you're visiting the museum, this is probably the way that you're going to enter. However, if it's really busy, I've got a trick for you that I'm gonna show you in a couple of minutes. I'm walking up the stairs into past these grand columns. The museum was originally opened in 1759, but it wasn't in this building. It was in a building called Montague House, which was a grand manor on this site. However, by the 1820s, that museum was no longer large enough. So sadly, it was demolished and Sir Robert Smirk designed this huge Greek revival building that has since been expanded a few times. Now, as I approach the entrance to the great court, this never fails to impress me. So if we were here before the year 2000, we would actually be outside right now. But today, this is the largest covered public square in all of Europe. That's because back in 2000, Norman Foster, he's the architect famous for the Millennium Footbridge, the Gherkin, London City Hall. He designed this impressive glass and steel roof, and then it was renamed the Queen Elizabeth II Great Court. So we would have been in the rain, but I'm really glad that it's covered now. So it's two acres of space here, and that's where you get a lot of the practical concerns, like the ticket booths, that's for paid exhibitions, and also the audio guides. You've got the ever important toilets and gift shops, some pretty good cafes, and also some really monolithic sculpture that kind of introduces you to what's in the different galleries. So here's one of my biggest secrets for anybody who's visiting the British Museum, especially if it's on a busy day. Don't enter through the main entrance unless you need to use the cloakroom facilities. Instead, go around to the back of the museum on Montague Place and use this entrance that I'm showing you right now. There's really short queues even in the summertime and um, sometimes you can even walk in. There'll be an hour long queue at the front of the museum and five minute wait at this entrance. The first place I'm gonna start on our museum tour today is room 33. Normally in non-COVID times, there's no ticket required, but it's a free timed entry ticket to come into this gallery, which is the South Asia and China Gallery, which spans more than 7,000 years of history from China throughout South Asia. I used to live in both India and Nepal for quite a time, and I'm really fascinated by the long and storied history of these countries. I'm not going to go into the Chinese side of room 33 today, but if you'd be interested in learning more about this, let me know. I can do an entire video on it. There's Ming Dynasty blue and white porcelain, Tang Dynasty tube figures, tons of jade and bronze sculptures. But today we're going to walk through the South Asian side, featuring the rich and diverse cultures of Nepal, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. I just passed by the dancing Nataraja from around 1100 and I'm just coming up on my left hand side to a Hindu temple figure of the goddess Kali. You can see around her neck she's wearing the severed heads of her victims. But we're here instead to see one statue in particular. 
we're here to see Tara. At the back end of this gallery, you can see her shining like a golden beacon. This remarkable statue is considered one of the top 10 things to visit in the British Museum for good reason. It's an 8th century statue, and it was taken from Sri Lanka, then called Ceylon, by Sir Robert Brownrigg. He was the Lieutenant General of Ceylon when the British took the mountain kingdom of Kandy in the north of the country. Today, we call this country Sri Lanka. It's the teardrop-shaped island nation located at the southern tip of India. Robert Brownrigg gifted this Tara statue to the British Museum in 1830, and the museum curators didn't know quite what to do with it. It's bronze dipped in gold, and it's utterly, utterly remarkable. I mean, just look at her figure, right? I often say on my tours, you know, wowie zowie. The museum, though, knew quite well that she was an object of meditation. She's not an object of titillation or eroticism, but the museum curators in 1830, I mean, that's almost 200 years ago. This is at the beginning of Victorian conservatism. They also knew that the conservative culture at the time would not see Tara as an object of meditation. So for the first 120 years of her time at the British Museum, she was in a special museum within the museum called the Secretum. Only scholars and VIPs were permitted to see her. But finally, the Secretum was incorporated into the rest of the museum back in the 1950s. So, okay, now we know what Tara isn't, right? She's not an object of titillation. But what is she? She's a part of Mahayana Buddhism, which is one of the two main types of Buddhism. It's usually found in North India, Tibet, and Nepal. However, today, modern Sri Lanka is a Theravadan Buddhist country, and that's the Buddhism that you normally find in Southeast Asia. Prior to Tara's discovery, there was no proof of a history of Mahayana Buddhism in Sri Lanka. So how did she get there? Well, she was first discovered buried in a coastal region, and people assumed that she was actually a Theravadan deity called Patini. But experts now agree that she's Tara, and she's the aspect of a male counterpart called Avalokiteshvara. There likely would have been a pair of statues like this one on either side of an altar. And that's proof of a medieval Mahayana tradition in Sri Lanka dating to around the 7th or 8th century. To give you an idea of how significant that is, that's like finding out that Britain used to be a completely Hindu country. <laughs> you know, it would really shock people. And that's exactly what this discovery did. Now, Avalokiteshvara, and that's pretty fun to say, is a bodhisattva, someone on the spiritual path to enlightenment. And he represents the compassion of all the Buddhists. I'm going to show you Avalokiteshvara in a couple of minutes. Now, if you magnify his compassion by a thousand, Tara represents his compassion. We're supposed to gaze upon her and meditate upon our own compassion. Now, here's that Avalokiteshvara that I was talking about. He's much younger than her, though. This one dates to the 16th century, and he's from a completely different region. He's from the Kathmandu Valley in Nepal, which is much further north and closer to where the Buddha was actually born. Now, we are going to leave room 33. Again, it's one of my favorite galleries in the entire museum. So let me know if you'd like to see a, a video just on this gallery. We're heading back out through the main entrance. It's really nice and quiet in here today. Um, again, this gallery, unlike a lot of the others, has timed entry, and that's because you can see that there are a lot of sculptures and statues that are just kind of out in the open. If it gets really crowded in here, um, it, it could be a security risk for the museum, not in terms of theft or anything like that, but just in terms of accidents happening. Now I'm going to leave out uh, this door, say goodbye to the guard, and we're going to head into the Welcome Trust Gallery of Living and Dying. Now, this is a completely different kind of gallery that we're about to enter into. It's a gallery that's curated around a central theme rather than a time period or a geographical region. So it's got pieces that are from all different time periods and all different geographical regions based on the theme of life, death, medicine, and how people from indigenous cultures around the world deal with sickness and the transition from our world to the realms beyond whatever their culture believes that to be. Each display case is filled with fascinating objects and labeled 
with the faces and names of the Indigenous stakeholders who participated in the gallery's design. That's a relatively new trend in museum curation. They are actually seeing Indigenous people getting involved or, or being allowed to get involved, being asked to be involved in curating galleries like this. And that's, you can tell this is a much newer gallery than some of the others in the museum. It's 2003. Now, filled with all kinds of treasures and we could spend all day here. I'll, I probably will say that about every room, but I really mean it but we're here to see this spectacular monolith. This is the gallery's most famous object, another of the British Museum's top 10 items. This is Hoa Hakananaya. Now Hoa Hakananaya comes from another island. We've been talking about Sri Lanka, but now let's talk about the isolated Polynesian island of Rapa Nui. You might recognize Rapa Nui by its more common name, Easter Island. It's so named because the first Dutch explorers landed here on, you guessed it, Easter Sunday in 1722. So the Dutch explorers and the Spanish and the British before them, they encountered a lot of people living amongst the toppled Moai. That's the name for this type of sculpture. The Moai date back to the 12th to the 16th century, and they represent specific ancestors. Throughout my tours, I always like to make connections about between the different objects. Remember, we've already seen something on this tour that dates from that time period, the Avalokiteshvara statue from Nepal. Now, this um, Moai represents a specific ancestor. He's not just a sculpture. To the people of Rapa Nui, he is a living being. Creating these Moai was incredibly labor intensive. It relied on a lot of cooperation and advanced artistic and technical skill of the people of Rapa Nui. However, creating these also relied on resources, especially a lot of trees. So it's likely that felled trees were used as kind of a conveyor system. And there you can see a bunch of moai um, standing up overlooking harbor. Absolutely beautiful. Making these probably used trees like a conveyor system to move the moai around the uh, one part of the island to another but some recent scholarship shows that they may have been walked the way that you would bump a heavy chair from side to side the gradual deforestation of the island led to an agricultural tipping point and the erosion of the soil some scholars argue that this society plunged into chaos and collapse but recent theories show that the islanders may have actually voluntarily decreased their numbers and practiced environmental stewardship so hoa hakananea has actually been used twice for two different religions. By the time that Europeans arrived, he'd been repurposed for the Birdman religion, which worshipped a god called Make Make. Now you can see the change in the carvings. We were just looking at the back of Hoa Hakananaya, which is shallow relief. It's not very deep, but the front is deep relief. That's evocative and complex carvings. It requires a lot of organization and a lot of food to keep people happy and motivated and in good strength. On the back though, you can see there's little shallow carvings, including, look up at the top right corner, a little picture of Hoa Hakananaya himself. This is made by a less thriving society. When the HMS Topaz arrived in 1868, Hoa Hakananaya was in a ceremonial house, but British sold sailors dragged him down the beach and locals were crying and begging running after it. As a result, this is one of the most heavily contested objects in the museum. And as that information panel I just zoomed in on detailed, the British Museum is currently in talks with Rapa Nui delegates for a resolution. The delegates visited Hoa Hakananaya in 2018, and they brought soil from Rapa Nui. You can see it in front, that woman's looking at the soil. And that's an offering to their ancestor. It remains seen what's going to happen to this iconic sculpture in the future, but in the meantime, He's absolutely marvelous. And if you'd like to come and see him in person, he's on my tour, obviously, but he's also well worth your time, even if you pop by just for a couple of minutes on your way to or from another London attraction. If there's no queue, why not? Hop into the British Museum for a coffee and just look at one or two things. It's a great way to explore the museum. Again, just zooming in on that view of Rapa Nui, a dream of mine to go visit there and some of the offerings that the delegation brought back in 2018. 
there was a lot of talks, a lot of news stories about this at the time, but the COVID-19 pandemic has kind of pushed that out of the news for now. We're going to head downstairs to the Africa galleries. So again, <laughs> I promised you I would say this about every room and I, I'm serious. We could spend all day in the Africa gallery. I'm just walking down the stairs. Uh, they're divided into East and West Africa, mostly focusing on the sub-Saharan regions of Africa, since many of the Northern African antiquities are in other parts of this building, like the Egypt galleries that we're going to visit a little bit later on. Uh, you can see there's some artworks in the stairwell, and I'm gonna walk past a couple of glass doors in a moment. You might see a name that you recognize, uh, Sainsbury's. Yes, the massive supermarket giants. Of course, you know, for tax breaks and also for goodwill from the public, a lot of very important corporations and families around the world donate heavily to museums um, in order to kind of reap those cultural benefits. And the Sainsbury Galleries are East and West Africa. Uh, we're going to head towards the West African side, but that doesn't mean that there's not just as much that we could talk about on the East African side as well. In a couple of moments, I'm going to start walking into West Africa here, and you're going to see some really amazing stuff. Uh, to catch your eye first, probably these massive carnival marionettes. They represent stilt walkers called Moko Jumbies. These are the first major contemporary works by a Caribbean artist in the British Museum. They're created by a UK Trinidadian artist called Zach Ove in 2015 to honor the Notting Hill Carnival. And you can see, I like to tease my guests, especially school kids, that these are really old. But then, of course, I zoom in there on the Nike shoes that the Mocha Jumpies are wearing. Um, some stunning uh, masks from different West African cultures. It's important to remember that West Africa is not a monolith. There are uh, hundreds, if not more, different cultures and um, unique histories and unique works of art. But we're here to see something in specific. We're here to see the Ife head. So the Ife head is one of 18 heads that were excavated in Ife, Nigeria in 1938. There he is, by a team led by German archeologist, Leo Frobenius. This was the former royal center of the Yoruba people, a place of rich culture from then to today, much earlier to today. Just look at the peaceful, beatific expression on his face. This man is serene, yet he's powerful. He's viewing us slightly from above. His face is decorated with ritual scarification, which would have been considered exceptionally beautiful. And his crown is topped with a rosette and a plume, slightly bent to one side, but it would have been painted red and black. The Ife head was created by an artistic master, but we don't know who. And he's likely a king, although we don't know for certain who, which one. And that's a really common theme in archaeology. We're going to see that same story again with the Sutton Hoo later on. Most scholars believe that the Ife head depicts a ruler called Oni. The head is made from an alloy of copper and bronze. Like Tara, it was made using the lost wax technique. And it's also approximately three quarters life size, just like Tara is. Different culture, different time period, but similar artistic vision. While he dates to the late medieval period, around the 14th or 15th century, subsequent excavations have provided evidence of a metal and bronze working culture dating all the way back to the 9th and 10th centuries. For reference, that's a similar time period to the Lewis Chessman, who we'll see a little bit later on. Upon encountering this stunning head, Frobenius simply couldn't believe or wouldn't believe that it was from Nigeria. He tried to come up with an alternate story. He actually went so far as to state that the Ife heads must have been created by a lost colony of ancient Greeks in the 13th century BCE. He even wondered if maybe this was the origin of the ancient legend of the lost civilization of Atlantis. But we now know this is like laughably incorrect. The Ife heads are not ancient Greek from 3,500 years ago. They're from medieval Africa more like 500 years ago, and they were likely made by an individual artist in a single workshop. African antiquities are a hot topic in the media right now. So again, let me know if you'd like to hear more about the museum's controversies. Right now, there is a lot of controversy about not only the Ife head, 
but some of these other remarkable Benin bronzes that I'm about to show you. These brass plaques were stolen by British soldiers. That's not contested. That's, that's the official history. Um, during a, a kind of a siege of a palace in Benin, they were locked away in a storeroom where they'd been taken down for repair and British soldiers carted them back in their um, personal effects and belongings. Many of them were donated to the British Museum. This great horde of them was donated to the British Museum. These date to a similar time period of the Ife head and they are absolutely beautiful as pieces of art but also as important historical records of this culture. Now there are these brass plaques found in museums all throughout Europe. But you may have read in the newspaper recently that a major German museum just agreed to give a lot of them back. And um, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford has also agreed to give back some Benin bronzes as well. So the British Museum is facing some pressure. It just took the lift up to back to the Great Court. All right, I'm back in the Great Court, and this time I'm here to see some Coast Salish house poles, sometimes called story poles, or you might have heard of them as totem poles. They're usually a symbol of indigenous people for all around North America. You'll see them in gift shops, but poles like these are only actually carved by a small group of different First Nations on the north coast of the continent. Places like Vancouver Island, Washington, the Haida Gwaii Islands, mainland British Columbia, and Alaska. And if you've been trying to place my accent... I'm from Vancouver as well, from the same place as these poles, but not from the same culture. Because one of these poles, this one here, is from the Niska culture, while the other that I'm heading towards now is from the Haida people of Haida Gwaii, which used to be called the Queen Charlotte Islands. By the way, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it's really a truly amazing place to visit. They're carved from cedar wood, which naturally repels insects and water. But after around 100 years of being erected, they would naturally fall down and then they'd be allowed to decay back into the earth and that would feed the next generation of totem poles. They're carved to mark significant occasions such as anniversaries, but carving totem poles was actually illegal in Canada from the mid 19th century through to 1951 because Christian missionaries and government forces saw them as barriers to First Nations assimilation. It was a lost, uh, nearly a lost art that's been reclaimed. When European explorers arrived to these coastal regions, they often looked at poles that they saw laying on the ground and they assumed they were unwanted. So they also bartered and bought some of the poles, which is the case of the Haida pole here, purchased in 1903 by Charles Newcomb from Chief Waya. Totem poles often depict animals and supernatural creatures and family crests and detailed stories. This pole tells the story of a life-giving raven spirit called Yetel, who could also swim beneath the sea and steal hooks and fish from rods. The villagers decided to change their hooks and bait them with devilfish, and one caught Yettle, pulling his beak right off his face. He was angry and hungry, and so he took on human shape and was then accepted into the village. But he spoke gibberish, and he only would ever show the top half of his face to hide his disfigured mouth, and he used a charm to win his beak back. However, he was impressed with the village and returned as a chief, and you can see that at the top of this pole. That's Yettle as the chief eating with the villagers. Today, there are totem poles in museums all over the world, and some of them have been acquired ethically and others have been taken without. Here's another hidden treasure of the British Museum, and no, it's not an object. It's the view itself of the Queen Elizabeth II Great Court. You can see, designed by Norman Foster, as we mentioned earlier, it's really hard to get a picture of this that represents the scale and grandeur from the main floor. However, when you come up to this little secret balcony, then you can find this absolutely fantastic place for selfies and photos. However, I'm about to head into room 40, which is medieval Europe. This is my personal favorite gallery in the entire museum. It's home to some of the world's most fascinating medieval treasures from Europe, Britain, the Byzantine Empire, and I find it really fascinated to see these archaic objects that are many of which are connected to the church from our not too distant past and think about how they shaped our current uh, reality. Wait a second. I'm <laughs> I'm a Canadian, but I've clearly been in the UK for too long because I'm now referring to the medieval period as our not too distant past. <laughs> Anyway, many of these objects are connected to the church, but there's one in particular that's notable for its secular nature. And that's what we've entered this room to see. 
this heading, I'm heading towards the case right now to go and look at the Lewis Chessman. Now it's always a bit of a challenge to look at the Lewis Chessman because there's always a ton of people gathered around them. These are some of the most famous objects in the museum. They, these curious little pieces were discovered in a church on the Isle of Lewis in the Outer Hebrides in 1831, but they are much, much older. They date to the 12th century or maybe even earlier. Most of the pieces are made from walrus ivory, but a few are carved from whale teeth. When found, the hoard contained 93 items in total. That was 78 chess pieces, 14 tablemen, and one belt buckle. 82 pieces are here at the British Museum, and 11 are at the National Museum of Scotland in Edinburgh. They were likely brought to the really bustling Isle of Lewis then, from Norway by a merchant, and then buried for safekeeping. There's pieces from four separate sets in the hoard, but most of the pawns are missing. Recently, a warder, which is the equivalent of a castle or a rook, was found in an old antiques collection, and it sold for a massive £735,000 in July 2019. I mean, multiply that by 93, and you get an idea of the immense value of this collection. Let's have a closer look at the fine detail and care that's gone into making these pieces. So just look at the carvings on the back of the king and the queen's chairs. So some of them are pieces that we recognize today with the addition of the warders and also some very peculiar chaps that I'm going to zoom in on and show you in a minute. The berserkers. Berserkers are fighting knights that bite the edge of their shield to show them, show us, the audience, how mad they are with rage. So berserk is one of the few Icelandic words that we've borrowed in English, and we still use it today to refer to somebody who's gone on a, a rampage, somebody who's gone absolutely berserk, is somebody who's a bit mad, and it kind of has a negative connotation. There you can see him. See what I mean about how he's biting the edge of his shield, and that's to bare his teeth and show us just how ready he is for a battle. The queen looks quite introverted. She almost looks miserable. Um, she's meant to be deep in thought so that she can give wise counsel to the king. Today, the queen is the most powerful piece on the board. But back in medieval times, the piece actually had very little power and could only move one square at a time. By the way, uh, if these pieces look familiar you might recognize them from harry potter and the philosopher's stone so you often get a lot of kids in here who are really excited to have a look at the harry potter chess set the harry potter chess set you can buy reproductions of the lewis chessmen in the gift shop you can buy them all throughout scotland they're really really famous pieces um we're not sure exactly where they came from but the most common theory is that they came from Norway, as I mentioned, but they could have also come from Iceland. Now here is another amazing piece that helps us step back to an even earlier Europe, to the centuries of 8300 to 1100 in this room, room 41. That time period used to be called the Dark Ages, but we now know that there was an immense amount of craftsmanship and global trade going on during this period. We're here to see the Anglo-Saxon ship burial at Sutton Hoo in Suffolk. If you want to learn about this, which is one of the most important archaeological discoveries in British history, I really recommend the movie Dig, which is on Netflix. It's on Netflix here in the UK. I think it's on Netflix worldwide, starring Carrie Mulligan uh, as a woman called Ms. Edith Pretty. So we have to step back in time to 1939. Edith Pretty decided to have one of the mounds on her property excavated. She herself had taken part in archaeological digs in her younger years, but she was in poor physical health, and she hired amateur archaeologist Basil Brown to do the dig. He would soon find massive ship's rivets, which would lead him to the most intact early medieval grave in Europe, a 27-meter ship. That's nearly 90 feet fully loaded with rich treasures buried beneath the earth. The ship contained unimaginable riches, including a solid gold belt buckle, silverware from Byzantium, garnets from Sri Lanka, there's Sri Lanka again, huge feasting bowls, sumptuous textiles, dazzling swords, and as I zoomed in on at the beginning of this uh, room, a helmet with a human mask. 
These have since been dated to around 600 AD. Look at this solid gold belt buckle that I mentioned a couple of seconds ago. When Basil Brown pulled this from the earth, it was just as dazzling as it is today because gold doesn't tarnish. We believe this dates to 600 AD, which is around the time of the Anglo-Saxon period, chronicled in the epic poem Beowulf. This mighty ship would have had to been dragged uphill from the river Debden and then buried in a deep trench mounded with soil. Clearly this grave belonged to somebody important, but we don't know exactly who. That reminds me of the Ife head. But like the Ife head, we have a reasonable guess. This is likely the final resting place of Anglo-Saxon King Raedwald, who ruled East Anglia. However, no body was discovered. It was likely dissolved by the acidic soil, along with all of the wood, cloth, and bone. Now, I could speak about each item in this exhibit in great depth, so please let me know if you'd like a video just about the Sutton Who. But for this video today, I'm going to focus mostly on its most iconic object, the mind-blowing helmet. So let's examine it in more detail. It's not only beautiful, but it's really functional. It's got cheek piece, deep cheek pieces and a vaulted cap. It's covered with imagery and symbolism, including fighting warriors and mythical creatures. But look at the eyebrows. The end of each is a wild boar, and there's a dragon head here at the intersection of the eyebrows. The entire shape of the mustache, nose, and brows make a flying dragon. Now this one is a recreation. The original was found smashed into hundreds of little bits. The eyebrows are lined with garnets from Sri Lanka, but only one of the garnets is backed with gold foil. Sorry, only one of the eyebrows is backed with gold foil reflectors. So if you looked at it in the light of a flickering fire in the Anglo-Saxon longhouse, you might feel like you were in the presence of the one-eyed god of Woden. I just want to stop here quickly in room 56, which is home to some objects from Mesopotamia that span 4,500 years between 6,000 BC and 1500 BCE. We're going to see another important Mesopotamian object at the very end of our tour that connects to something in this case here. So think of this as a little preview. The Royal Game of Ur is one of the oldest board games in the world, originating around 4,600 years ago. We know the rules because a Babylonian astronomer wrote them on cuneiform in 177 BC, and we've been able to decipher the rules from this. Two players would race from one end to the other, and the central squares were used for fortune telling. Now, this stand, Royal Game of Ur, uh, you can come to visit it in room 56. But I just wanted to stop here quickly because we're on our way to the Egyptian galleries. Now we're heading into the most famous galleries in the entire British Museum. The Egyptian galleries that explore death, funerary customs and the afterlife. The afterlife held a deep, important meaning for ancient Egyptians. After all, most of what we think about when we think of ancient Egypt is ritual and mummification and, of course, pyramids. So we could spend all day and, in fact, we could probably spend weeks in these galleries. So if you would like a video just dedicated on the Egyptian collection in the British Museum, let me know. Um, I also want to point out again that Visiting Egyptian mummies in almost any other city in the world, including in Cairo, comes with a steep admission price at most museums. And of course, in Cairo, it's absolutely worth it. In most cities, it really is. But again, just marveling in this wonderful fact. Look at all of these mummies from different eras across ancient Egypt that we can come and spend as much time as we like for free. I, though, uh, of course, I could spend a long time looking at these mummies of um, embalmed and preserved humans and of course these are not the mummies themselves we're just looking at the sarcophagi and the funerary coffins um, but I am drawn to one mummy in specific in the British Museum more than any others and the mummy that I want to talk about is not a human it is a cat in fact many many cats the ancient cat mummies of the British Museum so, of course, remember, the internet was uh, created to share cat videos. So we're just carrying on in a long tradition of cat videos. Um, in just a moment, I know I've not focused on it quite yet, but in just a moment, we're going to take a uh, walk up to the case holding the mummified cats. Now, 
Egyptian pets, uh, humans were mummified in ancient Egypt, and so were animals. So common ancient Egyptian pets included cats, dogs, monkeys, birds, gazelles, and even mongooses. And so you might already know that cats were worshipped and venerated in ancient Egypt. And cats and all their animals were mummified for a few specific reasons. First of all, they were beloved pets. So mummifying cats allowed them to join their owners in the afterlife. They were also offerings to different gods, and they were considered incarnations of specific gods, such as the cat god Bastet, who had the head of a cat and the body of a woman. In other cases, and here, finally, we're at the cats here, you can see them. Animals such as ducks were mummified in order to serve as food in the afterlife. And here you can see cats and kittens. Um, so important humans had been mummified for 5,000 years before it became common to mummify cats and other animals. So this cat mummy in specific, the, one, the largest one in the case, dates to around the year 30 BC. And around that time, Egypt became a province of the Roman Empire. For reference, that's only about 170 years after the Rosetta Stone that we're going to go see. While animal offerings had previously been bronze statues, mummifying actual animals gradually became cheaper than making bronze, and therefore they became more common. So during this time period that we're talking about, animal mummies were straight up mass produced, and we have literal millions of them in cemeteries dedicated to animal mummies in Egypt. The most famous is near the pyramids in Saqqara. In fact, so many cat mummies were excavated in Middle Egypt in the late 19th century that they were shipped to Liverpool to be crushed up and used as fertilizer in the fields. Think about that. When you are in Liverpool, if you go visit Liverpool, you could be walking across fields filled with fertilizer made from ancient Egyptian cat mummies. That's one of those things that sounds like an urban legend, but I promise you it's true. According to, according to common belief, some animals contained a ba, which was a part of the soul that could act as a liaison between this world and the spiritual world. So think of these kitties as spiritual messengers. Before they were mummified, the cat's body would have been dried and filled with a dry material like sand, and then they were arranged in a lifelike way and wrapped in linen. Just remember, cats were not the only animal mummies here at the British Museum. There's also a baboon, crocodiles, dogs, and many others. By the way, did you know that in the 17th and 18th century and earlier, people in Europe used to eat the human mummies by crushing them up and putting them in tinctures and medicines? Again, that's another one of those things that sounds like an urban legend, but I promise you, or a myth, not even an urban legend, but I promise you that is true. And if you want to know more about these weird oddities of the British Museum, please let me know in the comments and I will make a video just on the strangest things in this wonderful, wonderful building. So I'm just entering room 70. The objects in this room illustrate the rise of Rome from a small town to an imperial capital that controlled the Mediterranean basin and northwestern Europe and the Near East, extending from Scotland to Syria. This exhibition covers a period of about a thousand years from Rome's legendary foundation in 753 BC to AD 324, when the Emperor Constantine founded his new Christian capital at Constantinople. Objects on display here come from all over the empire, reflecting both its vast scale and diverse cultural and ethnic nature. But I want to stop and talk here about the Portland vase, not only because it's decorated with intricate cuttings and detailed scenes, but because it's influenced modern design in countless ways. This is one of the most requested objects in the British Museum gift shop, actually. The stunning Roman vase is about 2,000 years old. It's made from luminous violet blue glass that you can see reflecting, and it's decorated with a single continuous white glass cameo. It depicts two different scenes, including seven human figures, a snake, and two bearded and horned heads between, below the handles. It's very pretty. I think we can agree on that. But why is it so important? Well, let's start by saying that this was meticulously copied by pottery giant 
Josiah Wedgwood. You probably recognize that name, Wedgwood Pottery. He devoted years of his life to try to duplicate this ancient technique, but even he had to admit that he couldn't do it in glass. He had to use jasper ware, which is a type of matte stone. That's so fascinating to me that the ancients were able to do things that we couldn't do in 1790. So now today you can buy replicas of the Portland vase all over the world. And actually, one of Wedgwood's actual replicas is on display at the Victoria and Albert Museum, another amazing place. Please let me know if you'd like me to do a tour of the V&A. It's another wonderful museum. For me, the most inter interesting fact about this vase, though, is that it was completely shattered by a drunk who threw it onto another case. He was arrested, but the museum was changed forever. Or sorry, the vase was changed forever. And the museum as well, of course, more um, security was put into place because of instances like this. So a British museum restorer painstakingly pieced it back together, but he couldn't account for 37 small fragments. But it looked good. So they checked the remaining pieces in a box, and it was only discovered in eight, 1948, 100 years later. It was dismantled and restored again, but this time they could only add three of the 37 pieces. So again, in the 1980s, the adhesive was starting to look yellow, so conservators took it apart yet again. They fixed some shoddy repair work and they were able to integrate all but three of the teensy tiny pieces. So if you break something valuable in your own house, don't feel so bad because at least you didn't drunkenly smash the Portland vase, one of the most famous pieces of, of pottery in the world or uh, glassware in the world, rather. Uh, now, uh, just leaving room 70, and I am going to um, continue walking through these galleries as I head back downstairs to the main floor of the British Museum. I'm just entering into the Enlightenment Gallery now. The Enlightenment Gallery gives us a glimpse into how the museum would have looked when it was first founded. In the 18th century, wealthy, learned men rushed to collect treasures and replicas of treasures from all over the world. This collection is housed in the oldest room of the museum, which was originally designed to be King George III's library. In just a few seconds, I'm going to walk over to a bust of Sir Hans Sloane. He's often called the quote-unquote founder of the British Museum. There's his bust in the case there. We'll look back at it in a moment. He was an Irish botanist, physician, and collector who traversed the globe collecting objects and plant specimens. His wife, Elizabeth Langley Rose, was the heiress to sugar plantations that were worked by slaves, and the profits from the slave labor funded Sloan's immense personal collections. As you can see with this display case, the British Museum is attempting to reckon with this dark past. This display case is actually rather new. Within the last year, it's been um, put together. Sloan left 71,000 objects to the king in his will, intending them for public display, and his collection forms the backbone of the museum's collection. You can see here um, in the case lots of interesting information and very important information about what the British Museum is doing moving forward to reckon with and deal with how a lot of its objects have been acquired in the past and this is going to be an interesting project moving forward. I'm excited and nervous of course to see what happens in the future with displays like this. And again, if you'd like to learn more about the controversies of the British Museum, let me know. Now, in just a moment, we're gonna walk over to a very unique case. So we can see here how a learned gentleman would have arranged his collection. So throughout this tour, we've been talking a little bit about different ways that you can curate a exhibit. Uh, but here you can see that they're around themes instead of um, geography or an era. For instance, on this shelf, feet, including a big toe. Um, different objects, doesn't always matter where they're from, doesn't always matter what era, they, what, what part of the world, what era. You can also see from this display that the Enlightenment gentleman did not 
mind a good fake. See, part of having your own cabinet of curiosities was showcasing your intellect, and that's why this scary little creature is here. This is the Fiji mermaid. So Sloan and his contemporaries weren't always concerned about the authenticity of their collected objects, but sometimes they just wanted something that was a conversation point or something to talk about. And the Fiji mermaid is one of those. It was a different Fiji mermaid was originally created by P.T. Barnum, the great circus ringleader. He actually started his career working in museums. It's true. And one of his favorite objects in his museums was a Fiji mermaid similar to this one. So that's a gaff. It's a fake oddity that's created by sewing two animals together. In this case, and in most Fiji mermaid cases, it's a fish tail with a body made from wood, wire, and monkey parts. This particular Fiji mermaid dates to 18th century Japan, and it's been in the museum's collection since 1942. Let me know if you want a video about the strangest artifacts in the British Museum. There are some really weird things here. Let's walk a few steps to the Rosetta Stone. All right, here it is. The number one, the most authentic, the most famous. Oh, wait a second. Okay, you can probably tell by my touchy-feely fingers here that this is not the original. We are going to see the original next. This one is a replica and visitors are encouraged to touch it. I'm not being a horrible museum's guest. I used to be a, a museum curator's assistant. So I would never touch an object that I wasn't expressly invited to do so. Um, the Rosetta Stone itself, the real one, we're going to see it in a few minutes. But the reason I've chosen to talk to you here about this one will make a lot of sense in a few minutes because the real one, is absolutely thronged by people. This is a great place to talk about why we are so fascinated by a broken slab of stone. So first, let me just tell you how it was discovered before I tell you what it is. In 1799, some of Napoleon's men discovered the slab being used to hold up the wall of a fort in the village of El Rashid, which was known to the French as Rosetta. They were shocked to see three languages on the tablet, each seeming to say the same three things. Here I'm pointing to encircled um, words called cartouche. Trust me when I say that folks in the Enlightenment period were very, very keen to learn about what Rosetta Stone and other Egyptian objects said. Egypt mania was sweeping across Europe and the public was fascinated by all of the objects that the British and the French were bringing home in their battles. They wanted to understand what all of the temples and sarcophagi said. The French who kept, who found this object never actually had a chance to decipher it. The British acquired the stone in the Treaty of Alexandria and they whisked it to London. That's when the race to translate it started. British scientist Thomas Young had some early success, but it would be the French scholar Jean-Francois Champollion who had the first major breakthrough. He realized that the hieroglyphs, the name of the, of the Egyptian language here, was both part pictorial and phonetic. That means they give clues about pronunciation. He translated the cartouche. That's the French word for bullet. That's, that's what I'm pointing to here. It's named for the shape of the proper nouns. You can make out the name Ptolemy, but what does it actually say? So the story starts with Alexander the Great, king of the ancient Egyptian king, sorry, ancient Greek kingdom of Macedon. He expanded his empire for thousands of miles, including into Egypt, where the stone is from. His empire got too big, and after he died, it was divided into various kingdoms. The kingdom where this is from is roughly where modern Egypt is today. So after Alexander the Great, this kingdom was ruled by Ptolemy I. And after Ptolemy I came Ptolemy II, and then so on and so forth. Of course, Ptolemy V eventually, around 2200 years ago. Ptolemy V was a boy king, trying, uh, taking the throne at only age five. His kingdom was therefore ruled by a council, and there were a lot of people trying to overthrow him. The writing on the stone is a decree about the king that was then, uh, about, a decree about the king. It was then copied onto large stone stabs called stelae and placed in every major temple in the country. The stones read that the most influential priests in Memphis not the Elvis Memphis, the one in Egypt, that these priests supported Ptolemy V. And this stone also did something that everybody loves. It gave tax breaks. At this time in history, only the priests could understand hieroglyphs. The average person either spoke and read Demotic or Greek. Within a few hundred years more, 
not even the priests were using hieroglyphs and the language was lost. That's why the Rosetta Stone was such an incredible discovery. Without this stone slab, we may never have learned how to understand the treasures of ancient Egypt. And here is the real one. We've now entered into the Egyptian sculpture gallery. This is one of the most impressive rooms in the British Museum. It's filled with sculptures that span 3,000 years of fascinating history. And there's different monoliths and broken busts, but you'll find one of the most famous objects in the world, and that's the real Rosetta Stone. And as you can see, it's really packed with people. On this day that I visited, again, I'll mention, it was quite slow, but it is normally just heaving with people who all want to get a photo of the most famous object in the British Museum. You can see the front, you can see the back. For being such a famous piece, my guests often remark that it's a lot smaller than they're expecting it. I'm used to hearing that, especially about Stonehenge as well. People saying, wow, this is a lot smaller for an object of such importance. But let's go look at an object that's not small at all. Here he is, this monolith. When I look at him, Ramses II, I always think of these lines of poetry. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ye mighty, and despair. Percy Shelley wrote that poem in 1818 in his despair over Europeans removing precious antiquities from Europe. During this time, the British public was following the news about this monumental statue with bated breath as it made its way from Egypt to London on a very troubled journey. But before I tell you about the journey, let me, let's ask first, who is he? So Ramses II ruled from 1279 BCE to 1213 BCE, and he was one of Egypt's greatest pharaohs, so much so that nine further pharaohs took his name to try to cash in on his, own na on his name and success. So he was a warrior king, but he was also the ultimate self-publicist. He loved his own image. I think of him as the selfie king because he erected more statues than any other Egyptian pharaoh, and he even changed the inscriptions on other pharaoh statues to have his name. So he really loved his own image, and he had more than a hundred children to prove that as well. So this statue is called the Younger Memnon. It flanked the entrance to the Ramesium, a massive funerary complex at Luxor. When Napoleon's men tried to move it in 1798, they only succeeded in damaging it badly because it weighs seven tons. So there's a hole above his right nipple that was made during this attempt as Napoleon's men attempted to hoist the bust with poles. The French troops abandoned the statue and it sat dejected and abandoned. That is, until the British Consul General Henry Salt decided he was going to, and there you can see the hole I was mentioning, he decided he was going to be the one to bring it to the UK. He hired a true character. He'd probably be good in that, that new film, um, Nightmare Alley, an Italian strongman turned archaeologist and adventurer called Giovanni Belzoni to do the job. They used a complex system of hydraulics and hundreds and hundreds of men to pull it onto the banks of the Nile, and it finally arrived in England in 1818. During this time, the, the journey, Shelley wrote his famous poem, and he actually wrote the poem about this sculpture before ever seeing it. It was just so regularly in the news that it was he, the younger Memnon, or Ramses II, was a household name at the time. It was installed here in the Egyptian Sculpture Hall in 1821. By the way, Ozymandias is Ramsey's Greek name, so that's why Percy Shelley chose to title his poem Ozymandias. And here he is, more than 3,000 years later, still gazing down at us on this gallery. So he really is the ultimate selfie king. I'm now walking through the Egyptian Sculpture Hall, past more sculptures of, you guessed it, Ramses II. There's a lot of them here. And we're going to make our way towards the final exhibit that we're going to look at on our tour. We're going towards the ancient Assyrian guards. The ancient Assyrian guards are massive sculptures. They're actually the two of the heaviest items in the museum. Here's two Assyrian guards here. They look really big. You'd probably believe me if I told you that those were some of the heaviest objects. As we make our way past some exquisite Greek sculpture, we can see that these are much bigger. Assyrian guards. These weigh about 16,000 kilos. That's roughly a 
about 8,000 pounds. So they're extremely difficult to lift. So when they arrived to the museum in the 19th century, they actually had to be chopped into four different pieces, each of them to travel here. Uh, they come from the 8th century BCE, that's about 2700 years ago, situated on the gates of the city of Khorsabad in ancient Assyria. Today, that's situated in northern Iraq. Khorsabad was a walled city, so people had to enter through gateways. So these human-headed winged bulls were really um, important to the Assyrian Empire because they signified strength. They also protected the city from evil spirits. And uh, they, these sculptures have this really remarkable, almost 3D effect. And I don't just mean the way that they're popping off the walls like this in, in uh, both high and low relief, but in the fact that from the front, the Assyrian guards have two legs and from the side, they have four. Um, so it appears that they have extra legs as if they are walking in motion towards us at all times. So it's not really the same as modern 3D, but it's interesting to see that they were playing around with these different dimensions in the art. Uh, now, uh, you can see incredible detail, really quite remarkable to have these massive sculptures here. Um, however, I wanted to show you something a little bit more interesting. And here you can see all of the extra legs. He's almost a spider bull at this point. But I wanted to show you. Remember earlier upstairs, we stopped for a brief minute and we talked about the royal game of Ur. So a few years ago, when some museum conservators were cleaning this sculpture, they actually discovered these indents in the um, stone. And cleaning it a little bit more, cleaning it a little bit more, they uncovered millennia of dirt and grime crusted onto it and realized that scratched into the surface, just like maybe you or I might scratch a tic-tac-toe game into the sand, there was a board game of the Royal Standard of the Royal Game of Ur, or the Game of 20 Squares. So these guards at night were probably relying on these big, remarkable stone structures to do the job of guarding the gates. And then when they were feeling like, mm, we can take a breather, they would go play their game, which I think is fascinating because it shows that human nature 2,700 years ago, 100 years ago, seven years ago, today, and probably 2,700 years in the future, we're all pretty much the same. Now, as we head out back past these um, phenomenal Greek sculptures, I wanted to take this time to say thank you so much for coming on my tour. Well, as you can tell by the twilight coming through these panes of glass, it's the end of the day at the British Museum and it's the end of our tour. I really hope that you've enjoyed seeing all of the highlights of the British Museum as much as I've enjoyed showing them to you. And if you'd like to leave me a tip or you want to buy me a coffee, you can do so at the links below. Please remember to leave your questions in the comment section below. I'm always happy to answer them. And let me know if you'd like to see other tours of the British Museum or other museums in London in general. So it's bye for now, and I hope to see you on tour the next time you're in London. Thanks, bye.